This data set has been designed to test the properties of different asymmetric line shapes. The data are carbon S that have been measured from HOPG and HOPG has been selected on the basis that there ought to be a single peak that corresponds to the carbon S but there's also a degree of asymmetry in this peak. We have some loss peaks and there's also the potential for changes in background shape beneath the peak. So this represents quite a challenging peak model even though it, it ought to be a single peak because there's a certain interplay between the asymmetric nature of this peak and any background algorithm we use to remove inelastically scattered signal. The first job when constructing a peak model is to define an energy interval over which a background can be defined. So in this case I'm indicating an energy interval. I'm going to use an average width of 4. This allows the data and the background to tie at a particular point and the points that are tied to the data depend on the background. In this case it's a minimum limit so only one end of this background will be calculated to fit to the data the other will simply be a straight line of uniform intensity. If I wish to tie the data at both ends to the background then we need to choose a different algorithm from this one and one way of doing this is to select a Shirley background and press return at which point we calculate a background that ties at both ends and the background has structure so if I move to a different property page so I can then zoom in you can see that this background has a particular shape that is defined by the Shirley algorithm and then we might want to adjust the limits a little bit and the next problem is to find line shapes that will allow the fitting of a specific number of components to the data and in this case we ought to find one component corresponding to the carbon 1s without energy loss and then there should be two components that correspond to these loss structures here. Once a background is established the next step is to add components and this can be done on the components property page if we press create then a component is added on the basis that it minimizes the residual and in this case we need an asymmetric line shape and we can do this by adding a parameter to this LA line shape and we'll start off by saying 1 comma 1.53 this introduces asymmetry when I press return and to some extent this will accommodate the shape that we see here However, it does not fully accommodate the shape, so we need to do a few modifications, such as reducing the Gaussian contribution, and let's say fit again, and then maybe introduce a little bit more asymmetry. And this can be achieved by making the first parameter less than unity. So if I make that 0 0.9 and press return, we get a new line shape and it is attempting to accommodate the asymmetry that we see here. If we now look back at these loss structures and add some components here, so if we zoom into where we see the loss structures, then the peaks will be added based on where the residual is the greatest, and that was at this point within the visible zone that is. And then I can press create once again and produce a second peak which if we say fit we end up with at least a nominal fit for these data. We can see what the residual looks like. This residual is not as good as one would like. The aim for the residual should be about unity and in this case we're significantly more than unity and we can see why. The asymmetry and also the wing to the right hand side is a little shy of what the data is actually expecting and so what we need to do is make some modifications to the line shape. When we look at the components property page we see one of these parameters the forward half maximum for one of the components is showing red and this indicates that it's up against a, a constraint limit. 
So in this case, we've got a value of 2.24, so it's very close to that. And if I release that, and perhaps just verify that the other one is indeed broader also, I can say fit, and that too will cause a change to the way these data are fitted. Now, perhaps that was a mistake, because it's clearly broader than I really need for this component. So what I'll do is I will adjust this and then I'm going to fix this limit at about three. I think I'll do the same for the other one. So these are the two loss structures. Let's try fitting again. All right, so now we have a situation where although it's up against the limit, it does seem somewhat reasonable and the reason it was broader was because the asymmetry was not taking up signal that it ought to do. So how do we go about working out the line shape that would correspond to this asymmetry? And one tool for doing this is the test peak model button. So I'm going to make use of the test peak model button by selecting the line shape that I'm interested in testing and then selecting the button. And what I'm going to do now is sweep one of these parameters by entering square bracket, open, close square bracket, and pressing return. And that introduces a range that is about the value that was originally here and is now plus or minus 10% of what it was. So when I do a scan, what will happen is this asymmetry parameter that is associated with the right hand side will be scanned and hopefully I will see some changes in the way the line shape fits the data in this region here. And once completed we have a set of spectra that correspond to the original spectrum however the values that are listed here represent the parameter values that were adjusted before refitting the data. So if I scan down here, I should see in terms of the residual standard deviation, some variations, and I should see some information such as the residual showing me that the fit has improved at this point. Now let's just verify that the other components didn't do anything untoward and they have very much stayed in that position. So I've now obtained a better approximation to the data to the right hand side of the peak maximum. Now what I need to do at this point is work out an adjustment to the left hand side asymmetry that will also accommodate the data equally as well. So if I now select this and perform the test data again, I'm going to scan this one. Again, I'm going to do a 10% scan. I could enter values as you see here in a range that would allow a scan to occur on the basis of a specific choice. But if I just use the square bracket approximation, it'll give me a 10% scan. So we'll do that. And we have a new file that provides a new set of fits based on the new line shapes. So each one of these represents a different line shape. And we can see here we have a minimum. So we do look like we're going to get a, an improved residual on the basis of this. And if I look down this list, then I start to get somewhere about here. I've got the minimum. So now I've got what looks like a reasonable fit to these data. Maybe I could do another adjustment over this side, and maybe that would be achieved by altering the Gaussian contribution. So let's do a test on this one and this time I'll do a scan of maybe from 20 to maybe let's say 60 and press return. Let's have a look at the shape. It's again a minimum and if I scan down here I can see looking at the residual over here that I am obtaining improvements in the residual. So we end up with something that looks like a fairly reasonable peak fit for this HOPG based on an LA line shape. 
While the fit is reasonable, there is one issue with this peak model and it relates to how well these peaks are reproducing the data with components that have an area that relate to the integration region upon which these components are positioned. And the problem is that we want to be able to integrate signal and also measure the same amount of signal by summing the area of these components. And if that's true, this effective RSF would be the same as the RSF we see for these component peaks. Now, because this is carbon 1S, I'm using Schofield cross sections, the RSF is unity. However, while close to unity, the effective RSF is indicating the value is less than unity. And this is suggesting that the area of the graphitic peak is extending outside of this integration region. And therefore, we don't get exactly the same area as measured by these components as you do by the integration region. And it's for this reason that the LA line shape has a derivative line shape, which is called the LF line shape or Lorentzian finite line shape that allows the suppression of the asymmetric side that is protruding outside of the integration region so that you do end up with an effective RSF that's close to unity. The LF line shape is related to the LA line shape. It has the same parameters, the same A and B or alpha and beta parameters. It has the same Gaussian the difference is that there's a length parameter that is also associated with this and the length parameter is a value representing a distance from the peak maximum at which point these first two parameters are forced to a larger value than unity and in doing so it has the effect of suppressing the wings of these line shapes so when I enter 100 here as the length and press return you can see the suppression that has occurred here on the one side in particular and that's too much so what I'm going to do is adjust this once again and make this 200 rather than 100 and now you can see that the line shape extends nearly as far as it did before but it's not nearly as far as it was when it was an LA line shape with a parameter of 0.78 for the first parameter so when I say fit I end up with a, a fit that is still as good as the LA line shape. However, if we look at the effective RSF, it is very close to unity. So this value of unity indicates that the LF line shape prevents the asymmetry from extending beyond the integration region in the same way as the LA line shape did when the value was 0.78 for the first parameter. And this means that we can compare the area integrated by the region that is to say signal above this background where the integration is of the raw data that the area calculated in that sense will be the same as the area that we calculate if we sum all the areas of these components while data reproduction is important and the ability to measure area by a component is another important factor it's also worth considering why the LA and LF line shapes exist. And the reason for their existence is that they are close to what you see in a Dunyak Sunjik line shape, but with the added advantage of providing an area that you can compare against the integration region. The Dunyak Sunjik line shape introduces a shape which fits data very well but extends well beyond the integration region. In fact, attempting to use a dunyak sunjik line shape with a Shirley background has some interesting implications that are worth considering, and this is what we'll do now. If we take a copy of the current state of this peak model, we can then start working on it in terms of producing a similar peak fit using a dunyak sunjik. So let's take a copy and then we'll copy again so we can work on the Dunyak Sunjik approximation. And we'll do this by introducing a line shape that is not the LF, but will be a Dunyak Sunjik line shape. And you can see from the extent of this parameter that this value has been determined 
by scanning a, a parameter. In fact, it doesn't need to have this kind of precision, but we'll leave it nevertheless and press return. We end up with a line shape that is associated with a Shirley background, but not one that could be fitted if I simply press fit, because you can see the Dunyak Sanjik line shape is lifted well above the data itself. So I'm going to lower this and then say fit. And we end up with a fit. Let's just adjust here too. That gives us a comparable fit to what we had with the LF line shape in terms of a residual standard deviation. And we end up with a pair of lost peaks. They are perhaps of a different shape. The shape we have here is not quite so good as we had before, perhaps. But we can now adjust this and see if we can understand why we have to have an offset here in order to achieve a fit. In fact, if I carry on adjusting this offset, I end up with different fits. In fact, I start to produce a really quite a good fit. As you can see here now, the, the asymmetry has been accommodated and we have a residual standard deviation that is closer to unity than was achieved with the LF line shape. Again, we may have some differences in the shapes of these lost peaks and we have an offset that requires the Shirley background to be significantly different. And you can certainly see that the effective RSF is far below unity and that's an indication that this graphitic peak now is extending far beyond the integration region. The problem with the effective RSF is this offset in the Shirley background. Now one way of rectifying this offset is to introduce a third parameter in this DS line shape and we'll set that to say 60 and press return. And the effect of this third parameter is to remove from the Dunyak Sunjik line shape a Shirley background that is calculated from the Dunyak Sunjik line shape. So this means that we can now move the Shirley background up and attempt to fit again. And once again, we start to get a good fit to the data. And we also start to get an effective RSF that is very close to unity. So there could well be different adjustments that need to be made, but fundamentally, the Shirley background, if subtracted from the Dunyak Sunjik line shape, produces a shape that is very, very similar to the LF line shape. However, you can also see here that the Dunyak Sunjik line shape, if modified by this removal of the Shirley, allows a Shirley background to produce an integration region that is comparable to these components that are making use of a Dunyak Sunjik line shape. So this parameter here is the third parameter that will allow the removal of a Shirley type shape from a Dunyak Sunjik line shape.